Is it time to get your act together? Is it time to get your act together? And what does getting your act together look like for you personally? Not what anybody else says it should look like, but what does it look like for you? Getting your act together. We're coming into a new year. I think there's more opportunity right now in the world than I have ever seen, but there's also more challenges. Tell two cities it was the worst of times. It was the best of times. In this session, I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman, Dr. Peterson, that probably most of you have heard of and know about, but some of you may not. And if you're approaching the end of this year, really focusing on how to take your life and your business and every aspect of your life to a new level to improve your act in 2022. I think this will speak to you. I hope it does. I hope it inspires you. I can tell you without any reservation whatsoever that never in my life have I taken my act to a different level that wasn't, that didn't first happen after a conscious decision. What I'm saying is it doesn't happen by accident. It only happens by design. And I believe this session, my hope is that it will help you really focus and make quality decisions about what you can and should and may as well go for. In 2022. Welcome to the MLMSuccess.com podcast, the show designed to return the network marketing industry to its roots of personal growth, leadership development, and wisdom of the ages success principles. We share with you real success stories from real people that we hope will inspire and encourage you personally and help you progress forward in your business and your life. We believe if you build people, People will build the business. Now, here is your host who has been called the number one mind in network marketing, the MLM prophet, network marketing virtual mentor, and a host of other names that we will not mention because this is a family show. Frankly, he's just a small town guy that figured out that the real product in network marketing is people. Dale Calvert. I hope you've had a great week. This is Dale Calvert. I'd like to welcome you to the MLM Success Podcast can tell you the last week for me has been one of the, personally, has been one of the best weeks of this year by far. Uh, I just got back from Kentucky last night. I've spent a week watching my granddaughter play in about a dozen basketball games. She was in a tournament. And honestly, there's not a whole lot of things in this world I would rather do than cheer her on in her basketball games and just so proud of her. Uh, She's just, just an awesome young lady. And to see her out there as a freshman uh, playing against uh, junior and seniors, uh, girls, you know, three or four years older than her, and seeing, you know, what she's able to do and hold her own and fight and knowing the amount of time, energy, and practice that she puts into her game. It's just been an awesome, awesome week for me. I got to spend some great time with my parents which I always enjoy. I got to spend time with my sister, my brother-in-law, which Mark, which you guys have heard on this podcast, uh, and the book that he's wrote, and that's doing really well for him. Simple, simplified success. I know some of you purchased that, and he asked me to just say thank you to all of you that have purchased that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll put the uh, the link to that particular session in the show notes. Uh, I do want to ask you to pray for Kentucky and the people in Kentucky. As most of you probably know, we went through major, major tornadoes. Uh, over 75 people were killed. So there's a lot of families that are very disrupted during this holiday season. So please keep Kentucky in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I'm excited about this session because I think hopefully it will be timely for many of you. Uh, if you're a member of our program in your mind for success program, then you've, you've heard of Jordan Peterson. Uh, if you're a member of the program in your mind for success 
and while I'm thinking about it, if you're not a member, why aren't you? I mean, really, why aren't you? Have, have you watched the workshop? You know, we only open it up in December and it's open right now. And if you haven't, make sure that you schedule the time to do that now. Uh, you can register at programmingyourmind.com, get registered, and then you can watch it, uh, at your, at your convenience. Just make sure you do it sometime in December, uh, before we close it down again. But anyway, where was I? Uh, back to, to Dr. Peterson. Uh, I first discovered Dr. Jordan Peterson probably four, maybe five years ago. And once I found him, I spent a full six months, all, all, every minute of my personal development time each week, getting into and dissecting his teachings on human performance and the wiring of our brains. Uh, I have a journal that's just full of notes from his different books and lectures. And, you know, there's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive. And the truth is, if you are ready for Jordan Peterson's genius, he's going to speak to you. If you're not ready, he won't. Uh, I'm glad that I discovered him three or four years ago and not early in my career because I probably would have not been ready and maybe would have never went back and discovered him when I was ready. So the only reason I really uh, speak of him in the Programming Your Mind for Success group and, and have some of his videos in the members area and really don't talk too much about him outside of that group because network marketers are simply not ready because network marketers really don't understand that the real product is people. They don't really get that uh, in their heart. They don't get that. Most people avoid learning more about others because then they would have to learn more about themselves and they really don't like looking behind the curtain because they haven't discovered how to learn from their own path in life where life has taken them to this point and then more importantly they really don't like to take responsibility for their future it's much much easier to look back and see how things could have been or could have worked out different in the past than it is to take responsibility for one's future. The past is past. Now's the time to start anew. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. Most people don't like feeling that way. And if I continued, or if I counted on one hand, the five people that have helped me categorize, categorize my thoughts as it relates to business, our human emotion, and personal performance, uh, Jordan Peterson would definitely be one of those five people. And I don't talk about him. Uh, I don't talk about him a whole lot because, really, quite frankly, those that I have shared him with and talk with about him and some of his teachings, you know, the majority of them will go. And read, read something or watch, uh, one of his, his trainings, one of his lectures from Harvard or wherever he was speaking. And they come back and they're just, they don't get it. So as we move into a new year, I think now is a really good time to share this with you. Uh, I've got to give you a heads up. Dr. Peterson always <laughs> goes deep into human psychology. Uh, honestly, when it comes to human performance and understanding the wiring of our brains, he's in a class by himself. Uh, he puts the truth right in front of your face. People say Dale has a two by four. He, he has a two by four a lot larger than mine is. And without question, uh, he's, he gets in people's face and jars them like nobody I've ever heard. So it's going to take all of your focus to try to keep up with him. My hope is that you are sincerely ready to get your act together, maybe for the first time in your life. And those that have their acts together right now 
and you're wanting to take your act to a new level in 2022, like you will see me do, I'm going to do some things in 2022 I've never done before. And I think we should all enter that next year with that type of mindset. Uh, but if you're ready to get your act together for the very first time or take your act to the, to a new level, uh, this year, and if I'm talking to you, I hope the insights from Dr. Peterson will inspire you. We're going to listen to, listen to him and then we'll come back and I'll wrap this up when it's over. When I was 25 or so, I probably weighed about 138 pounds. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day. I drank tremendous amount of alcohol. I was from northern Alberta, this rough little town up in northern Alberta called Fairview. And, you know, there were long winters there and my friends were heavy drinkers. And most of them dropped out of school by the time they were 15 or 16, went off to work on the oil rigs. And, you know, it was a rough town and we drank a lot. I started when I was 14 and, you know, um, and so I was, I had a lot of bad habits, let's say, and uh, things that were, and I wasn't in great shape physically. And I was also still intellectually obsessed by as I am now and uh, so that would have been that would have been in 85 but when I but I decided around then about 85 84 something like that maybe a little earlier that I was really going to try to get my act together and uh, so I started doing that I you know I first of all I I quit smoking well that took a long time because I eventually had to quit drinking too in order to quit smoking and I started working out and playing sports which I'd never done I was a small kid I'd been skipped a grade and I was small small for my age so sports were never especially team sports were never really a domain of expertise for me um, although I skied and went trapping with my dad went you know cross-country skiing and camping and all that so but uh, when I went to graduate school I started swimming <laughs> the first the first uh physical exercise routine I did I enrolled in a swim exercise course I think it was called so it was me and this like really overweight kid and like these 60 year old women and men they could out exercise me like mad it was really embarrassing me and the, the overweight kid you know we'd be just panting ourselves three quarters to death at the end of the bloody workout and these 60 year old women who weren't in great shape were like you know chatting away uh, as if nothing was going on at all in the pool so that was quite embarrassing and as was going to the weight room, you know, because when I started, I could barely best bench press 75 pounds, and people used to keep coming over and helping me, which was the last thing I bloody well wanted, but certainly needed, and I got to the point where I could bench press 225 pounds, I think that was the best I did, and I gained about 30 pounds of muscle in a year and a half, so that was a good thing, so, like, I was kind of a wild man, and, you know, I'm a little bit manic in my, in my, uh, temperament so you know I was I was kind of going every direction at the same time so and uh, you know I don't regret that I had a fine time when I was a kid and but uh, I needed really to get disciplined and I had to do it because I was working on these hard problems that you know that I've been discussing with all of you and I've been working on them really you know obsessively since I was probably about 18 maybe even earlier than that and got to the point around 25 when I was in graduate school trying to get my PhD, so doing all my research. Like, I published 15 papers by the time I graduated with my PhD, which was by, I think, by a fairly large measure, the most papers that any undergraduate student at that time had ever published at McGill. I think that's right. It might have been twice as many, or maybe twice as many, maybe even three times as many. And at the same time, I wrote Maps of Meaning, which was a terrible, terrible, terribly difficult thing to do, because I was writing about three hours a day doing that, and I couldn't do all that and continue with my my misbehavior, you know, my sort of, my, what, what would you say, my, my, my hedonistic, my hedonistic, ma my massive hedonistic consumption of alcohol and all of that, I just couldn't keep it up and also work seriously on the issues that were at hand. So, you know, I had to stop. That's a sacrifice. I had to stop messing about and straighten myself out. And I, I got married who's my wife, Tammy, who, who I've known since she was eight years old. She lived across the street from me in this little town called Fairview, and I was in love with her, like, the first time I saw her, which is quite a bloody thing. So that's worked out pretty well for me. But she came to 
live with me about the same time and you know we decided jointly to get our act together and we swore that we tell each other the truth which i think she's actually done better than me like i don't think i don't think she's lied to me ever in our entire marriage which is unbelievable you know and it's been so useful because i can really tell her things and we can really talk so i tell you if you want to have a good relationship man you embed it in the truth because if you don't embed it in the truth you don't have a relationship it's, it's just lies it's it's a tissue of lies and it will it will dissolve in the chaos as soon as the crisis comes along so the truth is a terrible thing but not not compared to falsehood so advice for students here yeah read great books mm -hmm. really man you've got this four-year period that, that has been carved out of your lives by society they, they it's, it's given you an identity like a high quality identity and freedom at the same time and you're not going to get that again in your life you've got a you've got a respectable identity university student and complete freedom associated with that, or as near as you're ever going to get. And you've got these unbelievable libraries that are full of the writings of people who are who are intelligent and articulate beyond comprehension. And you know, and and you can go there and you can learn all this. And you might think, well, why should you learn it? Um, well, you learn it to get a job, or you learn it to get good grades, or you learn it to get a degree. And that's all nonsense. It's nonsense. The reason that you come to university to be educated is because there is nothing more powerful than someone who is articulate and who can think and speak. It's power, and I mean power of the best sort. It's authority and influence and respectability and competence. And so you come to university to craft your highest skill, and your highest skill is to be found in articulated speech. And if you're, if you're, if you're a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. And better than that, when you win everything, everyone around you wins too. Because to transform yourself into, let's consider consider your transformation to something approximating the logos. It means you shine a light on the whole world. Well, there's nothing more exciting to do than that. There's nothing better you can possibly do. And to think that you're coming to university to be, you know, trained to have a job, it's like, great, that's a hell of a lot better than being unemployed and covered with Cheeto dust while you're snacking away in front of your video game in the basement. But it's not, it's not a, and I don't have anything against video games, by the way, but, it, 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 but it's hardly a triumphant call to, to being in the world, and that's what universities should be calling for. It's like, God, you people, you, you know, I, I know what Harvard students are like. I taught here for five years. You people are spectacular. You're spectacular. You, you're, you're, you're all capable of being world beaters. You transform yourself into something that's articulated and sensible and grounded in history and knowledgeable and wise, man. You can do anything you want, and hopefully anything you want for good. Because if you have any sense, everything you want to do would be for the good. Because there's nothing more compelling or meaningful or, or useful in combating the tragedy of life than to, than to struggle with all your soul on behalf of the good. And the universities have forgotten that. It's why everyone's bailing out of the humanities. And they should. The humanities are corrupt. And they're corrupt because they're not telling students this. It's so bloody obvious. It's like, learn to think. Learn to speak. Learn to read. It makes you a superpower, an individual superpower. You have a, it, it, and I don't understand why that isn't just told to students. It's not that hard to understand, and everyone wants to hear it. It's like, really, I could do that? I could do that? It's like, yeah, really, you could do that. And the whole society around you has labored for really thousands of years to provide every single one of you with this spectacular opportunity that you have while you're undergraduates and graduate students here, man. They're just, everyone's just praying that you would come here and manifest everything that you could manifest. And that's what you should be doing instead of waving placards and complaining about how you're oppressed, for God's sake. You see these Yale students complaining about their oppression. It's just, it just leaves me aghast. It's like, well, we're against the ruling class. It's like, no, 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 you're baby ruling class <laughs> members. You're young. You know? <laughs> the only reason you're not rich is because you're young. You know, that's the best. Really, that's the, if you look at the 1% even, the, the dreaded 1%, you know, most of those people are old. Why? Well, when you progress through life, if you're reasonably successful, you trade in your promising youth for your wealthy old age. But you're still bloody old. Would you, would you trade it? Would you trade your youth for that? 
Like, if you factor age out of the economic equation, things look a lot different. Well, of course older people have more money. If they have any sense, they've been collecting it for their whole life. Is that somehow unfair? It's not unfair unless you want to want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. And you, and you don't want to be poverty-stricken when you're 70. So, I just don't understand what's happened to the universities. I can't believe that you're not told when you come the first day, look, man, you are, you're here on a heroic mission. You're going to take your capacity to articulate yourself to levels that are unstoppable. You're going to be able to do anything you want. It's like, that's what you're here for. Instead, you're taught that, well, you know, the world's a pretty oppressive place and you're probably at the bottom of the victim pile and, 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 there's, and there's, oh, there's virtually nothing you can do about it except, you know, deconstruct the patriarchy. And it's so weak need and so pathetic that, that, that universities should be embarrassed that that's what they're peddling to students. I'm embarrassed by it. You know, I've, I've gone on public record telling parents, bloody well send your boys to trade school because at least they'll learn something useful. And that's a terrible thing for someone like me to say because I do believe that, the art, that being articulated and educated in the highest possible manner is there's nothing that's better for you and for society. And why, are, why have the universities forgotten this? Well, that's postmodern neo-Marxism for you, you know. And then the philosophy of intense resentment and oppression and group identity. And God, it's just mm, pathetic. Dr. Pearson, I think a lot of students here would agree with you that one of the main purposes of uh, education at college, particularly at Harvard, is to develop their sense of articulation, their ability to read, their ability to crit uh, critically think. But then what comes after? Particularly at Harvard, there's a big discussion on what is a good life? What does it mean to use those skills that we get here and then we graduate? What do we do from there? Stop, and I think, stop mm -hmm. unnecessary suffering. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. You know, that, so, that, that's your calling. It's like you say, well, what do you do after you graduate? Well, if you graduate articulated and powerful, mm -hmm. there will be people giving you so many opportunities, you won't even be able to keep up with them. You know, and, and I've worked with comp very, very competent people in many different domains in my life, hyper competent people. And I can tell you some very interesting things about hyper competent people. The first thing is they are not selfish. And they're not greedy. And one of the great pleasures in their lives is to find people who have the capacity to also be hyper-competent and to open doors for them as rapidly as they can possibly be opened. They delight in that because there is, there's nothing, there's very few things that are more intrinsically meaningful. If you're an accomplished person, then to find young people who have the possibility of being accomplished and say, hey, look, here's an opportunity for you. It's like, go out there, man, kill it. And then they go out there. Worry about what you're going to do after you graduate from here if you if you turn yourself into half of what you could be because people will be dying to offer you every opportunity that you can possibly make use of. So it's 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 a moot point that the, the world is always desperately short of people who can think and speak. And and you think, well, I that, I won't be made use of. Well, you first of all, you can't say that if you're in if, if you're in Harvard for God's sake. I mean, people already figured out who you are. They've already figured it out. And they're offering you the world on a on a gold platter. They take it. It's yours. Take it. It's like great, man. Put yourself together and deserve it. That would be great. And that's what everyone wants. It's what your parents want. It's also what you want. You know it. It's what you want. It's what men. It's what women want from men. It's what men want from women. It's like for you to be who you could be. And then with the highest faculty of the human being is articulated speech. It's, it's the divine faculty, and there is nothing more powerful than that. There's nothing that's even in the same league. And so if you, if you don't have faith in that, then, you're, then your priorities are misplaced. And I, I can't even understand why you wouldn't have faith in that being, say, Harvard students, because look where it's got you already. You know, you're already sitting on top of the world. So make, deserve it. Make use of it. Right? Go out there and fix things up. That's what you need to do. There's lots of things that need to be fixed up. And what you want to do is burden yourself with so much responsibility that you can barely stand. And then you'll get stronger trying to lift it up. And you won't be asking, what should I be doing with my life? Or what's the meaning of life? Or any of that. It'll be self-evident. It's self-evident. At minimum, you could say, there's more suffering in the world than there should be. And I could probably do something about that. And you can do something about that. So go do something about it. And then there'll be less suffering in the world. And then when you're 80, you can look back on your life and say, well, you know, there's less suffering in the world than there, than there would have been had I not existed. And, and 
You don't have to even have a, a sense of, of ultimate destiny or even any sort of theistic belief to regard that as a positive good. Like, I think it goes beyond the, the mere pragmatic utility of addressing the world's ills, because I think we do live in a, in a, in a world that has a transcendent reality as well as the reality that we can detect. But even independently of that, it doesn't matter. It's like, I mean, this is part of the reason I like people like Bill Gates is a great example, man. That guy is, he's after five major diseases at the same time, right? He's trying to wipe out polio. He's trying to wipe out, um, malaria. Yeah, exactly. He's trying to wipe out malaria. It's like, well, what should you do with your life? Well, you know, take a look at Bill Gates and see if you could do something like that. That would be good. You know, if you take people, and I've told you this, and you expose them voluntarily to things that they are avoiding and are afraid of, you know, that they know they need to overcome in order to meet their goals, their self-defined goals. If you can teach people to stand up in the face of the things they're afraid of, they get stronger. And you don't know what the upper limits to that are, because you might ask yourself, like, if for 10 years, if you didn't avoid doing what you knew you needed to do, by, the def by your own definitions, right, within the value structure that you've created to the degree that you've done that, what would you be like? Well, you know, there are remarkable people who come into the world from time to time. And there are people who do find out over decades-long periods what they could be like if they were who they were. If they said, if they spoke their being forward. And they get stronger and stronger and stronger. And we don't know the limits to that. We do not know the limits to that. And so you could say, well, in part, perhaps the reason that you're suffering unbearably can be left at your feet. Because you're not everything you could be and you know it. And of course, that's a terrible thing to admit. And it's a terrible thing to consider. But there's real promise in it, right? Because it means that perhaps there's another way that you could look at the world and number, another way that you could act in the world. So what it would reflect back to you would be much better than what it reflects back to you now. And then the second part of that is, well, imagine that many people did that because we've done a lot as human beings. We've done a lot of remarkable things. And I've told you already, I think before that today, for example, about 250,000 people will be lifted out of abject poverty and about 300,000 people attached to the electrical power grid. We're making people, we're lifting people out of poverty collectively at a faster rate that's ever occurred in the history of humankind by a huge margin. And that's been going on unbelievably quickly since the year 2000. The UN had pl planned to have poverty between 2000 and 2015, and it was accomplished by 2013. So there's inequality developing in many places, and you hear lots of political agitation about that. But overall, the... The tide is lifting everyone up, and that's a great thing. We have no idea how fast we can multiply that if people got their act together and really aimed at it. Because, you know, my, my experience is with people that we're probably running at about 51% of our capacity. So, I mean, you can think about this yourselves. I often ask undergraduates how many hours a day you waste or how many hours a week you waste. And the classic answer is something like four to six hours a day. You know, inefficient studying... Uh, watching things on YouTube that not only do you not want to watch, that you don't even care about, that make you feel horrible about watching after you're done, that's probably four hours right there. Now, you think, well, that's 20, 25 hours a week. It's 100 hours a month. That's two and a half full work weeks. It's half a year of work weeks per year. And if your time is worth $20 an hour, which is a radical underestimate, it's probably more like 50 if you think about it in terms of deferred wages. If you're wasting... 20 hours a week, you're wasting $50,000 a year, and you are doing that right now, and it's because you're young, wasting $50,000 a year is a way bigger catastrophe than it would be for me to waste it, because I'm not going to last nearly as long, and so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient, 20 times more efficient, that's the Pareto distribution. You have no idea how efficient, efficient people get. It's completely, it's off the charts. Well, and if we all got our act together collectively and stop making things worse, because that's another thing people do all the time. Not only do they not do what they should to make things better, they actively attempt to make things worse because they're spiteful or resentful or arrogant or deceitful or, or homicidal or genocidal or all of those things all bundled together in an absolutely pathological package. If people stop 
really, really trying just to make things worse. We have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, social judgment, both of which are, 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 are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. And that's the thing that's interesting, too, is that, like, one of the, another thing I've often asked my undergraduate classes is, you know, there's this idea that, that people have, that people have a conscience. And you know what the conscience is. It's, it's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. You don't have to listen to it, strangely enough. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident. Because you, you know, I knew this was going to happen, I got a warning it was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. So you might say, well, what would happen if you abided by your conscience for five years or for ten years? What sort of position might you be in? What sort of family might you have? What sort of relationship might you be able to forge? And you can be bloody sure that a relationship that's forged on the basis of who you actually are is going to be a lot stronger and more welcome than one that's forged on the basis of who you aren't. Now, of course, that means that the person you're with has to deal with the full force of you and all your ability and your catastrophe and that's a very very difficult thing to negotiate but if you do negotiate it well at least you you have something you have somewhere solid to stand and you have somewhere to live you have a real life and it's a great basis upon which to bring children into the world for example because you can have an actual relationship with them instead of torturing them half to death which is what happens in a tremendous a tremendously large minority of cases well, it's more than that, too, because, and this is what I'll close with, and this is why I wanted to introduce Solzhenitsyn's writings to you, you see, because it isn't merely that your fate depends on whether or not you get your act together and to what degree you decide that you're going to live out your own genuine being. It isn't only your fate. It's the fate of everyone that you're networked with. And so, you know, you think, well, there's 9 billion, 7 billion people in the world. We're going to peak at about 9 billion, by the way. And then it'll decline rapidly. But 7 billion people in the world. And who are you? You're just one little dust moat among that 7 billion. And so it really doesn't matter what you do or don't do. But that's simply not the case. It's the wrong model. Because you're at the center of a network. You're a node in a network. Of course, that's even more true now that we have social media. You'll, you know, you'll know a thousand people at least over the course of your life. And they'll know a thousand people each. And that puts you one person away from a million and two persons away from a billion. And so that's how you're connected. And the things you do, they're like dropping a stone in a pond. The ripples move outward, and they affect things in ways that you can't fully comprehend. And it means that the things that you do and that you don't do are far more important than you think. And so if you act that way, of course, the terror of realizing that is that it actually starts to matter what you do. And you might say, well, that's better than living a meaningless existence, it's better for it to matter. But I mean, if you really asked yourself, would you be so sure if you had the choice? I can live with no responsibility whatsoever. The price I pay is that nothing matters. Or I can reverse it and everything matters. But I have to take the responsibility that's associated with that. It's not so obvious to me that people would take the meaningful path. Now, when you say, well, nihilists suffer dreadfully because there's no meaning in their life and they still suffer. Yeah, but the advantage is they have no responsibility. So that's the payoff. And I actually think that's the motivation. Say, well, I can't help being nihilistic. All my belief systems have collapsed. It's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. And the price you pay is some meaningless suffering. But you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr. So that's a pretty good deal, all things considered especially when the, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, it's like, yeah, maybe. Maybe you've just allowed them to collapse because it's a hell of a lot easier than acting them out. 
and the price you pay is some meaningless suffering. But you can always whine about that and people will feel sorry for you. And you have the option of taking the pathway of the martyr. So that's a pretty good deal, all things considered. Especially when the, uh, when the alternative is to bear your burden properly and to live forthrightly in the world. Well, what Solzhenitsyn figured out, and so many people in the 20th century, it's not just him, even though he's the best example, is that if you live a pathological life, you pathologize your society. And if enough people do that, then it's hell. Really. Really. And you can read the Gulag Archipelago if you have the fortitude to do that, and you'll see exactly what hell is like. And then you can decide if that's a place you'd like to visit, or even more importantly, if it's a light, if it's a place you'd like to visit and take all your family and friends. Because that's what happened in the 20th century. If you're hungry, it's not a deterministic drive. It's a subpersonality that has a goal, and then it has a bunch of action patterns that are going to work in reference to that goal. It has a bunch of perceptions that, that suit that goal, and it organizes your emotional responses around that goal. And so to think about it as a personality is a much, it's a much more intelligent way to look at it. One other thing about Skinner's rats, you know, Skinner could get rats to do almost everything, and he would reward them with food. And so he had a simple rat model. But his rats were starved down to 75% of their normal body weight. So not only were they not social, gregarious rats, like rats are, because they were isolated, they were genetically um, altered from wild rats, but they also weren't as complex as a real rat because they were starving. And so, but, you know, a starving rat is a pretty good model of a rat, and a rat is a pretty good model of a person. But our, a lot of our models of simple behavioral learning were based on starving, isolated rats. So, anyways, how to think about motivation? We'll think about it from the hypothalamic perspective. So we could say one thing that motivation does is set goals. We could say that emotions track progress towards goals. And I'm going to use that schema, even though it's not exactly right. So you say, well, motivation determines where you're going to aim. So if you're hungry, you're going to aim at something to eat. And then that will organize your perceptions so that you zero out everything that isn't relevant to that task, which is almost everything. You concentrate on those few things that are going to facilitate your movement forward. When you encounter those things, that produces positive emotion as you move through the world towards your goal and you see that things are laying themselves out that facilitate your movement forward. Those things cause positive emotion. And if you encounter anything that gets in the way, then that produces negative emotion. And it can be like threat because you're not supposed to encounter something that gets in the way. It can be anger so that you move it away. It can be frustration, disappointment, grief. Those would... If, if you had a response that serious to an obstacle, it would probably punish the little motivated frame right out of existence. You know, so you walk downstairs and, I don't know, the contracting company has set a wrecking ball through your kitchen. It's like, that's going to be disappointing. You're not going to keep eating the peanut butter sandwich in the rubble. That little frame is going to get punished out of existence, and some new goal is going to pop up in its stead. And, you know, one of the things we're going to try to sort out is how do you decide when you've encountered an obstacle that's so big that you should just quit and go do something else, because that's not obvious. You know, and you can, you can get into counterproductive persistence pretty easily. So we, we don't know how people solve that problem. It's a really complicated one. So anyways, we're going to work on that scenario. Your hypothalamus pops up micro goals that are directly relevant to biological survival. That produces a frame of reference. So it's not a goal. It's not a drive. And it's not a collection of behaviors. It's a little personality. And the personality has a viewpoint. It has thoughts that go along with it. It has perceptions. It has action tendencies. All of that. You can see this in addiction, most particularly. So one of the things that you find often with people who are alcoholic is they lie all the time. And that's because when they're, they built a little alcohol-dependent personality inside of themselves, or a big one, might maybe it's 90% of their personality. And one of, that, one of the things that compo consists of is all the rationalizations that they've used over the years to justify their addiction to themselves and to other people. And so the addiction has a personality. You know, and so when the person is off, or maybe they're addicted to meth or something like that, where we you know the addiction is more... Let's see. It's, it's more short-term powerful, than I would say, than an alcohol addiction. They'll say anything. And the, 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 the words are just tools 
use to get towards the goal. And if they happen to be deceptive, whatever, it doesn't matter. They're just practical tools to get towards the goal. And then when you get towards the goal and you take a nice shot of meth or something like that, you reinforce all those rationales that you use to get the drug, and then the next time you're even a better deceiver and liar. So, okay, so we're going to say motivations, one way of thinking about it is they set goals, but it's not the right way of thinking about it. They produce a whole framework of interpretation. And so we're going to think about that framework of interpretation. And then emotions emerge inside of that. So that's it. So the world is framed. Motivation set goals. You could say the world has to be framed. So motivation sets that frame. Crews goals, emotions, perceptions, and actions. And then actions track progress. So positive emotion says you're moving forward properly towards your goal. And if you encounter something you don't expect, you stop. That's anxiety. It's like, oh, we're not where we thought we were. And so we don't know what to do. So we should stop because we don't know where we are, what we're doing. Stop. Frozen. And then the more powerful negative emotions like pain, they might make you get out of there. So emotions, forward, stop, reverse. That's your emotions within that motivated frame. So, and that's another example of how your mind is embedded in your body. You know, emotions are like they're, they're offshoots of action tendencies. That's, that's the right way to think about it because action is everything fundamentally. So what are some basic motivations? Uh, most of these are regulated by the hypothalamus, by the way, and that, that tells you just how important a control system it is. The other thing that's useful to know about the hypothalamus is that it has projections going up from it that are like tree trunks and inhibitory projections coming down that are like grape vines. So you can kind of control your hypothalamus as long as it's not on too much, but if it's on in any serious way, it's like it, it wins. So partly what you do to stop yourself from falling under the dominion of your hypothalamus is to never ever be anywhere where its action is necessary, right? You don't want to go into a biker bar because you might find yourself in a situation where panicked defensive aggression is immediately necessary. You probably don't want that. You don't want the panic. You don't want the terror. You don't want the frenzied fight. You don't want any of that. You don't want to have to run away in absolute panic. So you just don't go there. And then a huge a huge part of how we regulate our emotions is just by never going anywhere where we have to experience them. And so that has very little to do with internal inhibitory control and everything to do with staying where you belong. So, okay. So, basic motivations. Hunger, thirst, pain. Pain is not regulated by the hypothalamus. That's a different circuit. Anger slash aggression. Thermal regulation. Panic and escape. Affiliation and care, sexual desire, exploration, play. And you can kind of break those in. You can kind of break those into uh, the classic Darwinian categories, too, and say, well, there's a set of motivations that go along with self maintenance. That'd be your survival, ingestive and defensive. See, I've sort of coded them there. So the, the self maintenance. There's an ingestive set of basic motivations that go with self-maintenance. You say that's hunger, thirst. There's a set of defensive motivations, pain, anger, thermal regulation, panic and escape. And then there's, there's motivations that are associated with reproduction, affiliation, care, and sexual desire. And then I put exploration in place sort of outside of that. Uh, well, I would say because those two things serve both of these approximately equally. Unfortunately, this session kind of abruptly stops there, but man, he's given us a lot to think about. Uh, I could listen to Dr. Jordan Peterson for hours on end and actually have. Uh, almost everything that comes out of his mouth is worth devoting some of your own thought to. As I've said for many years, you know, the teaching is in the words, but the learning is in the silence, in your own personal thought. I just want to share with you five ideas he spoke about that I think are worth thinking about. They certainly are for me and hopefully you uh, as they relate to you, me, and our goals in 2022. I think one of the reasons I really like him is he's a university professor, highly acclaimed, that that calls out universities. He can, he, he calls out the whole university and their educational systems. And it, it's created a lot of mixed emotions for a lot of people. But, you know, for many years, I've been 
uh, ridiculed for calling out network marketing. Uh, and the, the people that I felt like needed to be called out and, and the, the programs and the, and the systems and the ridiculous, uh, uh, philosophies that have been propagated throughout this industry for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. I mean, I've been very outspoken about that. And as he is about universities, I think that may be one of the reasons I've just really connected with him. One of many reasons. Uh, I know that from following him that, you know, he was a university professor for years. Somebody put one of his uh, videos, I think, on YouTube, and this whole thing started. And, you know, no question, his reality surpassed his expectations. And he's been intelligent enough to step out of the limelight for probably about a year or so. Uh, because he was getting massive backlash, which I know that he really could care less about. Personally, he doesn't care, uh, because he, he knows what he knows and he believes what he believes. But, you know, I've heard him relate to the fact that it's been hard on his colleagues, his other professors. You know, people don't want to be seen with him. <laughs> that he, they've been friends with him for years because he's calling out universities. And it's been harder on his friends and his family, so he just kind of has been out of the limelight for a while. But he hit and hit strong and has provoked a lot of thought for a lot of people all over the world. So let's just look at about five things real quick that he talked about. Uh, number one, he says, read great books. Read great books. And some of you have heard me talk about this, but when I first got involved in Shackley in 1980 and I realized I've got to start reading that that true leaders are readers, true leaders are readers. Thank you, Charlie Tremendous Jones, for that. Uh, and I remember on my go board having one through 20, and my goal was to read 20 books a year. And I did that for many, many years. And then when audio books can start, came out, then I've, you know, been able to listen to three to four, five audio books every single month. And readers are leaders. And why I'm on that topic, write this down. CMG, it stands for Calvert Marketing Group, cmgbookclub.com. It's free to join. We have awesome people in that group. We have phenomenal facilitator and Shelly Giddings, people that have real insight, sharing their ideas and philosophies. And this over the past year, they've discussed and read The Magic of Thinking Big, Ryan Oster's Success, uh, the Think and Grow Rich movie, um, Psycho-Cybernetics, The One Thing. Uh, I could go on and on and on with the books that they that that they have done over the last twelve months, and this is open to anybody, and it's free of charge. CMGBookClub.com. dot com. Because some of you think, well, Dale, I'm just not a reader. Blah blah blah. I get that. I understand that. But what would happen to your 2022 if you were involved with a group of people that you can trust? And you read five, six, eight phenomenal books in 2022. What, how much of a difference could that make uh, on your on your coming year? I mean, it's easy to do. It's easy not to do. You don't have to read a lot. They just they, it may take a month to go through a book. You know, read four or five chapters a week, which anybody can do. And then they discuss it Sunday evenings. Uh, I try to jump in there when I can. Uh, but I, I, there's very competent people that are there and discussing. And I do try to get in on it when I can. And I will probably be doing more of that, you know, this coming year. But it, it's just an idea that we've had that I know that has made an impact, positive impact for a lot of people. Number two, he talked about. If you become a master at formulating your arguments, you win everything. <laughs> you win everything. 
and I don't really like the word arguments, but I appreciate it. But but your your opinions, your 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 thoughts, you know, so many people just are, are headline readers and they just talk the talk, but have never really spent much thought in what they're saying. It's not really most ideas that people are trying to communicate are just something they've reheard, but they, they've never really gotten from their head to their heart. But I do believe that the ability to formulate your thoughts and when you can call them your arguments, uh, the people that are able to do that and communicate it win everything. I mean, there's people that I violently disagree with, but I appreciate their ability to communicate their points no matter how off base I know them to be. Um, he says, you know, many times, learn to think. Learn to think. You can become an individual superpower. And you can. You know why? Because most people never learn to think. They, they have no self-awareness. And they never learn how to formulate their their feelings, their beliefs. Uh, most people just react emotionally. Uh, emotions uh, trigger uh, babbling many times. Number three, he said, confront your fears. And he, and he gave this uh, a phenomenal example. What if you got in the habit of confronting your fears? Because once you do that, you get stronger. You get stronger. Uh, you know, you have nothing to fear but fear yourself, but fear itself. You know, someone said, and you com- if you confront your fears, you're going to become stronger as a person. If you don't, you become weaker. And he said, what would your life look like in 10 years if you got in the habit of every day, every week, every month confronting your fears? And he said, speak your being forward. Speak your being forward. That's where real promise, that's where you really tap into your full potential. As those of you in the book club have already read when when you went through this year, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Dr. Shad Helmstetter, there's probably not a book that I have recommended more over the years than that book. As far as overcoming fear, I've covered that in more sessions in this podcast than any other topic because the stop does start most stop most people. And he said, when you can learn to confront your fears, your positive emotion, it's off the chart. And the compounding effect is unbelievable. And he talked about adopt the responsibility you know you should adopt. What responsibilities do you know you should adopt going into 2022? Then do it. I mean, it, it, it's really that not that difficult. It's it's just quality decisions, quality decisions. I, I thought that was phenomenal. He said, when you live your authentic self, I think he calls it the being you were designed to be or something like that. The ge- your genuine being was his term. You you become a force to deal with. You cannot become a force to deal with attempting to become a force to deal with or attempting to do and say what you think other people want you to do and say. You become a force to deal with when you when you live it's in his words, genuine being. And then I love the fact he talked about the ripple effect. That's something you've heard me talk about many times on this podcast. And the ripple effect that network marketing can have on everybody around you, your children, your grandchildren, your neighbors, everybody. Network marketing is the most powerful personal development program in the world with a compensation plan attached. And he says, when people's beliefs start to collapse and they start living uh, fake lives, he says it becomes hell, in his words. 
And he said, when you're surrounded by everybody around you living these superficial fake lives, then everything around you becomes just intolerable. And I think authentic people seek out authentic people. And I think they can sniff out those that are not authentic pretty quickly. And then the last point is something that I never had heard him say. And it kind of hit me because I never heard anybody really talk about this. And and his term was counterproductive persistence. Counterproductive persistence. And he said, when you're in a, when you're in a counterproductive persistent mode and you're working hard, you rationalize, we rationalize around whatever framework that we've developed and, and how that framework is interpreted, interpreted. And so we're working and we're working in a state of counterproductive persistence. Counterproductive persistence. Th- that's a powerful term. Because if you're not moving forward after 90 days in network marketing, I've even said, look, if you've been involved in network marketing for 90 days and you have not enrolled anybody, uh, you should probably consider finding a different mentor are just leaving the business. And I believe that, you know, and I realize there's some gurus that are out there telling you, I'm going to share with you how to be a high paid network marketing consultant. Even if you've never sponsored your first distributor or enrolled your first customer, that kind of crap is going on in this profession. But the truth is network marketing is not for everybody, but the yang of that, I talk about yin and yang a lot that there's not a person that I know that's making a full-time six, seven-figure income in this profession that at one time when they got started had doubts if this was really the path for them. So, you know, I left after five years after my first company and vowed that I would never join again. And I was out for over five years. And that's not a good mentality to have either. But... This counterproductive persistence, there's a lot of people that are working every day and getting nowhere. It's a counterproductive persistence. And we've talked to all of them in the last year or so. I mean, they're banging their head against the wall. They're with the wrong company at the wrong time in history uh, and multiple other reasons. But they think because work, they're working Therefore, they, they will re- achieve success. And I can't tell you how many people over the years said, you know, I've been around three or four years and I'm not there yet, but I'm going to get there. And I say, awesome. How many people do you have on your team? Well, I haven't sponsored anybody yet. Listen, you're, you're delusional. You're delusional. You're just delusional. You're with the wrong company, wrong time in history or the wrong team. And, and I'm not trying to be harsh but there is a path for everyone, and it's our responsibility to find it. And then he said, and, I, and it's so true, it's so true. He said, action is everything on a fundamental basis. Fundamentally, action is everything. And that's true. The start stops most people. It's not, it's not the decisions we make that create mediocrity in any aspect of our life. It's the ones we never make. It's the ones we never make. It's like, see, some of you right now, you're thinking, I'm going to join that book club, but you'll never get around to it. And again, it, it it's not going to affect me one way or the other. I'm not rarely even on there, but it's going to affect you. There's some people I talked about programming your mind, and you have to get through that workshop you know, as soon as you can and go to programmingyourmind.com and, and do that. And it's in the workshop itself. The information will make an impact. It's going to give you a, 
uh, 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 an understanding that you probably never really grasp, even though you think you've already heard everything. But when I get into the subliminal subduction part, it's like it's going to blow your mind and you need to be on that workshop. And it's you, you, you do and you need to internalize it. That's something that is vitally. It's the most important thing. You know, our mindsets are the most important thing to determine the quality of our life. So I'm going to shut up. Uh, I hope this is giving you some things to think about. I really do. Uh, you know, he, I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with all of this. Uh, this whole human performance, I guess because over the years I've seen so many people that I knew had tremendous upside potential. But they, they didn't see it in themselves. And I've just been fascinated by that. And then I've been fascinated with derelicts, uh, many which become gurus in network marketing, consultants and trainers that don't have a clue, have no emotional intelligence whatsoever. But they think they, they can sing. Uh, going back to my American Idol example, they think they can do it, so therefore they do it. It's just taking action. Action fundamentally is everything. But if you can take action with the right company, the right compensation plan, the right time in history, and with the right team of people, your upside potential is beyond anything most people can even ever comprehend. So that's all I'm going to share with you this week. Uh, I hope you and your family have a phenomenal, phenomenal, blessed Christmas. Uh, as I think I probably mentioned, I just got back from Kentucky last night, and I'm leaving to go back to Kentucky. I had to come and pick up Don and the dog, Kinsey, and we will be heading back to Kentucky tomorrow. Uh, I've got to be in Kentucky by 5.15. Uh, I'm actually recording this on a Friday. It's not going to drop to until Tuesday, as it always does. But I've got to be back in Kentucky by 5.15 because Kentucky plays Ohio State at 5.15, and I don't want to miss any of that. Uh, and then we're going to be spending time with my family, and it's always phenomenal. Our Christmases are are just great. And uh, so I'm so looking forward to that, and I hope you and your family have a awesome, awesome holiday. And... Enjoy the Christmas season. Enjoy your family. Uh, wherever you are, be there. Take it all in. Uh, love on people. And uh, I'll be back with you next Tuesday on another session of the MLM Success Podcast. If you haven't gone over to iTunes yet and rated and left this podcast a review, what are you waiting for? At Calvert Marketing Group, we want to spend our time on the projects that we know are providing the most value for our clients and customers. You leaving us a review and feedback on iTunes is something that helps us more than you realize. And more importantly, it helps others like you find us. So if you've not taken the time to rate this podcast, please go over to iTunes and do that for us now. It will only take a couple of minutes out of your busy schedule. Work harder on yourself than you do on your business, and we will be back next week with another inspiring success story, wisdom of the ages training, or answers to your questions.